Boston's traffic is not only bad, it is actually the fourth worst in the world. You can see the expressway, it is busy this evening. Frustrating reality for people commuting in and around Boston. I'm laughing because you'd otherwise be crying. Right. Hello and welcome to the Problem Child Podcast, a show where we discuss politics, engineering, and technology with my dad. Say hi. Hey there. First off, let's do some introductions. Uh, I am Luke McCarthy, an engineering undergrad at Boston University. Pronouns he, him. And I'm John McCarthy. I'm a clinical assistant professor in the Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. But most importantly, you're my dad. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the first episode and we will be talking about cars and car infrastructure and how it doesn't always go super well. So before we start talking about anything, I think it's important to use the Socratic method and think about what is car? What is car? Um, for me, it's something that gets me from point A to point B. So next question is, what is highway? And I, I want you to break down the difference between a highway or a road and then also a street. Well, I, it seems like a, road, a highway or a road should be a more efficient way of getting around. Um, you know, something that takes you through an area quickly and efficiently. Whereas? A street uh, is where more people would be, I would imagine, and that, you know, there's shops or different th reasons that you want to be able to stop there and, and you wouldn't want people driving around as fast. Right. That is a very good uh, summary. The, the basic difference is a highway is, or a road, is to get from point A to point B. It's to travel between places. And a street is supposed to be more of a place. Like a place that you go, a place that you live, etc., etc. And the definitions aren't like super important. It's just good to have vocabulary to talk about this later on. Let's talk about traffic. You know traffic. Talk I, about your traffic this morning. Ooh, it was tough. Well, I had to cross uh, the Sagamore Bridge, which was under construction, which mm -hmm. was pretty painful because there's one lane and um, going either way, and you could see it had backed up and there was no alternative. Um, so that was pretty awful. And then uh, as I got closer to Boston, once I hit 93 north, uh, it was just painfully slow, and this is literally in the middle of the morning. So it's in between, it's after rush hour. Well, there is no rush hour. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's the problem. It, it would appear <laughs> that's right, because I was, it was like well after the, you know, nine o'clock, and I'm, and it's around 10, 10 to 10.30, and it just seemed like it was the middle of rush hour. Yeah. So, would you say that Boston traffic is good or bad? I would say it's increasingly awful because <laughs> uh, there's just so many places where it just gets painfully slow. And you know, the data actually backs you up a lot on that. There's a group called INRIX and they do like traffic reporting for around the country and Boston's up there consistently worse in the country, which is great. Yeah, not where we want to be leading. <laughs> no, uh, we also lead on housing costs, uh, so that's that's great. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> so, the real question that we're going to be discussing today is, how did we get here? You know? Uh, so, let, let's uh, roll back in time a little bit. So, this is post-World War II, we have so much money, we have all this stuff, and white flight starts to happen because the Federal Housing Authority is like, hey guys, if you are white, you can go live in the suburbs with a very, very cheap loan. So people are like, sick, I don't have to live in the dirty city, because remember this is like post-industrialization, so yeah. the city is not particularly clean. Keep in mind, the Boston Harbor was still like actually disgustingly rancid at this point, like you could not swim in it, it was toxic AF. So people started moving out to the suburbs, because they're like, this is a nicer place to live, you know, just, I, I want to live there, and it's cheap. Um, so the problem with that is, Suburbs are zoned in a way where you can only have residential zoning, so it's, it's called single-family zoning, you know? Uh, actually, over in the majority of Boston greater area communities, 80% of the zoning is still single-family zoning today, but it's besides the point. Basically, single-use uh, zoning, which means that you can only live there, which means that you have to go somewhere else to go to work or to buy things, you know, yeah. common. Um, so people still want to go into the city, 
but there's too many cars to go into the city. So the city of Boston is like, we have a plan, the central artery. So what they were going to do is build a bunch of highways throughout the city to make it easier to get in and out over time. As many have experienced over the past hundred years in Boston, uh, traffic was really bad before the artery. And then after the artery, it was still really bad. <laughs> and we spent like in today's dollars, billions of dollars building this and it did not improve the traffic infrastructure. So yeah, in Boston, knowing traffic is really bad. This is in like the seventies or eighties. It was like, hey guys, we have a really good idea. What was this? The big dig. The big dig. They're gonna they're gonna do it again. They're gonna remove the elevated highway and make a sub underground highway. Yeah, uh, you, because that was an eyesore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as one that was like growing up as the big dig was like being proposed. I know you didn't live in Mass that much at the time, but like do you have any experience of that? Oh I do. Actually was there in the in, in the nine it went into the nineties, so um, I was there for a good part of it. And there was construction everywhere, so that was a nightmare. Um, and well, the city's never done. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> family saying. Uh, yeah, it'd be a nice city if they ever finished it. But, um, <laughs> but if we think about like how much um, it, how long it took too. So it wasn't just like a it, inconvenience for a while. It was literally a decade of time. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the end of that? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I knew we were going to another story. Yeah, so it took a really long time. I, I used my bike a lot during that phase, so that's yeah. why I wasn't as impacted by it. <laughs> um, so the big dig, they were like, okay, the elevated highway didn't work, but we still have traffic from all these people in the suburbs, so let's build an underground highway. And it, it was initially posed at like a couple billion dollars, I think it was like three or something. Uh, and it ballooned to $25 billion because like, let's be real here. That was in an insane construction project. This was like bigger than the Panama Canal size, insanely big. They were digging tunnels hundreds of feet underground, 14 lanes wide. It was in a, a huge, huge construction project. And the idea was that we can move all these cars underground, we can modernize the electrical infrastructure because you can put cabling under there, uh, and we can do other things like clean up the Boston Harbor with some of this money, like reroute the sewage to sewage plants. But most of the money was spent on the tunnel network. So after doing all of this, how would you describe the traffic in Boston? <laughs> well, it isn't very much at all better <laughs> yes <laughs> like yeah there's some places where you can like you could connect to 990 now the the mass massachusetts turnpike which was easier or you could take the turnpike all the way into the airport which i think it wasn't all connected so there are some improvements in that way but the traffic itself it's still awful which is like a little bit comical because Boston tried one time to fix the traffic and it didn't work. And they tried again and we're like, wait a second, this didn't work? What? And I mean, okay, let's be real here though. Big Dig did have some major improvements. Like uh, the I-93, the F Fitzgerald, whatever, Greenway, yep. um, where they removed the elevated highway and now there's a green space there. That's pretty nice. Have you been there? Don? Yeah. yeah. No, that that's, that's makes it a walkable area now. Which is an improvement. Yeah. And I it, mean... And the getting the elevated highway down, is it's less noisy and stuff. Yeah. And um, I mean, there's still three lanes of traffic yeah, each way. So on both sides. There's six lanes of traffic total. Uh, around this green space, which is like, it's better than an elevated highway, but it's still like, okay. Yeah. Um, but I guess the point that we're trying to make here is repeatedly Boston has tried to fix traffic by building more car infrastructure and it hasn't worked. And like, especially in the big dig, they spent a huge amount of money. And really the only things that moving the traffic underground accomplished was creating a green space, which you could have done by just not having a highway. They could have just removed it. And all of the aesthetic things of like fixing the North End and all that kind of stuff could have been accomplished without spending all that money. And, and it, it makes me worried about 
once those start to de deteriorate, oh, how God. much harder it is to once, fix them. Once they start to yeah, deteriorate, or, like, like, like I the think panels start falling. 2008, falling. and like someone died to a light, and they had to re like do all of the lights because salt got into the big dig. Yeah, it's like oh, it's not good, yeah. not looking good. So I guess one question that we have that we will be discussing is why is it like this? Um, one thing uh, is rich people. We, we know lots about them. They're in the news all the time because they own the news. Um, but one reason that a lot of the time we ignore the issues with how we're trying to address our ish problems is because rich people don't want us to address those problems. So one What do you mean by that? Okay, yeah, yeah. So one statistic is that rich people don't ride transit. They mm -hmm. just don't. And... Also, another thing is that America, there's, there's more in the show notes if you guys want to look into this. I wrote a nice little paper on that. Um, but America basically is a plutocracy. Those with money have the power. So if you combine those with money having power and those with money liking cars and not wanting to take transit, suddenly you have a clearer picture of, oh, the people in power don't want transit and they're not going to listen to you kind of vibe. And there's, this is also worsened by people like Elon Musk who purposefully go out of their way to ruin good public transportation projects. For example, um, this one is The Loop, as you may you may have seen in the news. Have you seen it? Um, I heard about it, but didn't know really anything about it. Basically, he was having traffic in L.A. and he's like, hey, instead of having California high-speed rail as they've been working on for like 20 years, I'm going to pitch this thing to the city called The Loop. It's going to be a bunch of underground tunnels where you can drive your Tesla. And he's, by doing this in many cities and pitching it at a cost that isn't realistic because you can't build something like that for that cost. He's like stalling out projects by the city being like, oh, maybe we should do that when it's not real. Yeah. So using his clout as a rich engineer to like just destroy public transportation, which is, yeah, kind of sucks. Yeah. Anything else to say on this? Uh, well, it seems like but he's only one guy. He, he, it's kind of like a case study of okay. like how rich people like go out of their way to destroy things that are good to the public. All right. Well, um, what, why is not that not feasible? Why is what not feasible? The loop. The, the loop. Well, to use the loop, you can't have a gas car in there. So you have to have an electric car, which is one issue. Two, how are you going to get the cars down there? Like, well, you can have ramps? <laughs> then you have the same issue. It's just a bunch of single-lane tunnels. Yeah. Like, it doesn't fix any of the problems with the... It just says, like, hey, buy a private vehicle and you can drive more. Mm. Yeah. Because, yeah. like, maybe you can have more throughput underground, but you're still bottlenecked by above ground where everyone lives. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, finally, we're going to talk a little bit about actual solutions and what we're actually doing today to fix this, specifically in Boston. Uh, so one is the T improvements. Uh, we pledged to spend over $10 billion revitalizing and working on the T. Michelle Wu has been behind this a lot. Anything to say on this? Ooh, we need it. I mean, uh, you know, recently this year, the slowdowns, uh, the you know, minimal speeds, that the, the different um, accidents that have happened. So, and it clearly doesn't run efficiently. No, and one of the main reasons for that is because we've been neglecting maintenance for so long. Like literally, the cars on the red line and the orange line specifically have coupled, they're called, I think, married couples, married pairs, I forget what they're called. They have train cars that are over 50 years old with mm. millions, if not tens of millions of miles on them, which is absurd how old those things are. Yep. It's impressive they still work. Yep. And they are replacing them. But it's taking time, and there's a lot of issues with the contracting. Like, there's this whole kerfuffle that... Have you heard about this? No. Basically, um, we were like, hey, we need new train cars. We're going to order them from a foreign country because they actually manufacture trains in foreign countries. But then the Fed, who was paying for part of it, was like, um, no, we are going to go with a local dealer. So then uh, there was a local dealer that pledged, but they haven't ever made trains before. They made, like, fridges before this or something. <laughs> Um, so then it's been like 10 years and they've only delivered like a third of the cars and it's just, it's not going well. Um, but they are trying at least, and we have a new director that's going to be working on this for the MBTA. Like there's stuff that's happening. It's just like, you know, pretty, pretty bad. I mean, I, I just came back from Seattle and I was using a train to go from the airport to a baseball game and it was like super easy <laughs> and, they, and, and the cars like the trains were way longer mm -hmm. than, than the T. And, and you felt like, wow, this would be a, 
an improvement. I don't even know how good it is in Seattle, but it seemed like way better. Yeah, Seattle, they, they do have their stuff together a little more. Um, they're not the best in North America. I th the best are like Toronto, those those areas, I think maybe Vancouver. They're like doing very good. Canadian cities for some reason yeah. are well, better than us. They're Canadians. Uh, yeah, too nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like Seattle is good. Boston is like middling. But we have the infrastructure. It's there. We just need to use it better. And update it? And update it, yeah. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, and then the other thing that we're doing a lot is bike lane expansion. Um, so we, uh, you see, you were talking about how you did biking back in the 90s. Tell me about it. Ooh, it's, uh, I used to bike in, in, in the late... Yeah, we used to uh, rollerblade too, which was, <laughs> which was treacherous. Uh, I think there were a lot of places where you just couldn't... You couldn't bike. You know, you just had to be... There wasn't even a way to connect to it without going on like a major highway so i kind of look forward to the time when there's more yeah and um i think this year 10 more miles um are being built just by the end of 2023 which is great i'm looking forward to that more connected uh protected highways is like i'll always go for that or not highways bike lanes um and because that will that make a difference in the in the volume what do you mean well like the traffic volume is like how much bike expansion would make a difference, do you think? Oh, okay. Um, so this is something that has been touched on a lot by other people, not me in my paper or this, but um, there's something called the Downs-Thompson Paradox. Mm -hmm. And the basic idea of it is that if you have, let's say, bus infrastructure, bike infrastructure, any type of infrastructure where it's relatively safe and easy to use, the fastest one decides the car traffic. So mm -hmm. let's say you were trying to go from... What's the what's the Jamaica Plains Orange Line station? Yeah, uh, what's that called? Um, Arbor Way, Arbor Field. No, um, my computer just died. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I don't need the notes anymore. Uh, um, you know what I'm talking about, though? Like the one next to the Arboretum. Yeah, that's in JP. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, let's say you're going from here to there. The like how long it's going to take driving generally should match how long the public transportation from here to there takes. So okay. if you can build out bike lanes and bike networks that are fast and easy to use and safe, and you can build out bus that's like separated from traffic and like trolley lines like we have, yeah. w whatever you can do that isn't cars, if you can make that fast, it reduces traffic in fold. Because people, most people don't care that much about driving. It's more of like, I mean, some people definitely do. They're always yeah. going to drive. Yeah. But the majority of people are like, I just want to get to work and I want to get there easily, cheap and quickly. Yeah, and reliable. And reliable. That's yeah. the that's the thing that's coming up more and more with the traffic is, I can't even judge how long it's going to take me to get to work anymore. And that's actually that's a big issue with the Orange Line right now. There's a lot of people writing into like the mayor Monday with the mayor's on um, uh, Radio Boston talking about like, hey, I need the Orange Line to get to work, and it's not consistent. And if you have that, I think that is one of the main driving factors of why people are driving more and more and the traffic is getting worse. It's because people are saying, I can't get to work on yeah. public transit. What am I going to do? And the option is either public transit or drive because the bike infrastructure isn't good enough right now. Yeah. Like getting to JP right now, I know they're going to fix it by the end of the year, yeah. but it's like scary going through that. Like for me, it's scary. And I'm a psycho on my bike. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Downs Thompson Paradox. We need faster public transportation and bikes. And yeah, I think we are roughly out of time by negative five minutes. Uh, yes, we are. Uh, do you have any closing, no, negative 10 minutes, oops. Do you have any closing statements to talk about just like transit in Boston before we close up? Are you good? Uh, I'm pretty good. I, I just think I've noticed the, this kind of increased at all times of day and uh if you can solve this it'll be really great <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll solve it by myself <laughs> with the sheer you, force of you will. and your classmates <laughs> yeah. must must solve this all right uh that's it i do not have a closing segment today uh thank you for listening to the problem child podcast i hope you all have a lovely time and stay safe out there